I wanted to continue our discussion about dynamic programming this week. Uh, in particular, I want to talk a little bit about practical DP. Because most of the innovation that I see around the world is happening in the context of specific applications and being able to use dynamic programming to further optimize the processes and, uh, and uh, activities in order to minimize certain cost function. So the first thing that I want to talk about is a constrained DP. So we had talked about unconstrained DP so far, um, but I want to uh, give you just a basic background in constrained DP, which is how would you solve a problem if there are state action constraints at every point of time? How would you solve those DP problems? Uh, so that's number one. And uh, after talking about constrained DP, I want to talk about curse of dimensionality. And then I want to talk about approximate dynamic programming. Okay. So these are the three things we'll be discussing today and on Wednesday's class. And then for the final week, I'll send out a survey so that you can uh, give me some feedback about what is it that you would like to study in the last week of classes. Okay. So let's talk about constrained dynamic programming. I have the usual state update equation. So yeah, let, let me write the state update equation. Um, I have the state space capital X of T. I have the action space U of T. So these are state and action space. And I'm going to assume them to be general. So it could be discrete, it could be continuous, it could be the entire RN. So it's any general set. I have the usual performance index J I have the policy gamma t that maps the state to the action set. This is the closed loop policy. It takes as input the state and outputs the action that you need to take at that particular point of time. The performance index is as usual, t minus one, which is summation of the running cost and the terminal cost. But now we have a problem and the problem is that I am only allowed to pick actions such that G of X T comma U T is less than equal to zero for all T. So this is the constraint. So I have some state action constraints. So I have, uh, let's say a battery and I cannot discharge the battery more than what the current charge on the battery is. So the current charge on the battery would be the ST and how much you can extract, how much energy you can extract from that battery would be UT. And so your UT has to be less than equal to XT in that situation. Or you could have the constraint that UT has to be strictly greater than zero. Okay, so that those are the constraint that you need to satisfy uh, at every point of time. So this constraint has to be satisfied at every point of time. And now we want to come up with a way to solve this problem where you have the state transition function, you have arbitrary state and action spaces, you have the definition of policies, you have the performance index, and you also have constraints that you need to meet at every point of time. Okay, let's stop a moment for questions and discuss how would we go about solving this problem. So you have this constraint, 
how can we incorporate this constraint in the backward induction method for dynamic programming? So let me take any questions, if there are any. No questions? So can someone come up with a method for solving this problem? Can someone tell me what should we do in the dynamic programming recursion to solve problems of this type? What would you do? Uh, we transform it into unconstrained by uh, the, the Lagrange multiplier uh, methods that we okay. Uh, did earlier. Okay, great. So the first approach is I define another performance index J tilde, which is summation of CT plus capital CT plus, plus what? Plus I'll lambda have, times I'll have G of Lagrange mm, multiplier mu t times the g of x t u comma u t. Okay. Sorry, g t of x t comma u t. So is mu t going to depend on something? Would mu t be dependent on the state or the action or like what should I? Like, is mu t supposed to be constant throughout time? Mm -hmm. Don't think so. Okay, so so what do you think? So let's let's say the mu t changes with time. So let me add this summation of time component. So I have mu t transpose. And then what? Should I? I mean, it, it seems unlikely that it won't be state dependent. So, so I guess you have to add the state. What about action? What about action? Okay, so, so not quite sure. Right? Is that an accurate description of what you are suggesting? Kind of. Yeah, kind of, right? So you want to relax the constraints. You want to add it to the cost function like we do in Lagrange multiplier method. But we don't quite know whether this mu t should be time invariant, it should be time varying, whether it should depend on the state, whether it should not depend on the state. So those are the questions we, we quite not quite answer at this point of time. But this is certainly one way to do it okay and we'll revisit this problem later on slightly later on what's another way to do it okay so we have this constrained optimization problem i want to minimize this performance index over policies that has to satisfy these constraints at all time. We can also reduce our action space like uh, to to those actions only that which are feasible at that xt. Right, but the actions that are feasible depends on the state. So, uh, so that will be dependent on, on the state. Uh, we will have a, for each state, we will have some action pairs, uh, actions that okay. are feasible okay. for that space. All right, all right, so feasible actions. Okay, I understand what you're saying. Feasible, so I define a feasible action set, ut of xt, which is the set of ut in ut. Let me change it. Let me say a, at of xt, which is the set of ut such that g of x t u t less than equal to zero g t is this what you're saying uh, yes professor 
Okay. So I restrict my action set um, at every point of time. And this restriction depends on the current state of the system. Okay, so how would you write the DP recursion under this situation? So I have V capital T of X capital T equals to CT XT. How would I write VT of XT? Someone else wants to wants to give me some hint. How should I write the recursion for the dynamic programming? Minimum of ut belonging to atxt. Uh, such uh, and the and it will be ct xt comma ut plus vt plus one ft xt ut right right okay so this is this is actually the correct way of defining the dynamic programming recursion for the constrained optimization problem. So you, you found the way to solve this problem. Okay, now you can apply the principle of mathematical induction to show that the optimal policy that comes out of this recursion is it meets all the constraints at every point of time. So it meets this constraint that GT of XT comma UT is less than equal to zero. And it also uh, is optimal for the cost function uh, or the performance index within the constraint set. Okay, so this is the constraint DP recursion. Very good. Okay, so this, this may sound like very complicated, but actually it's not because I can rewrite this particular optimization problem as minimum VT of X of T as minimum of CT plus VT plus one composition FT of XT comma UT such that GT of XT comma UT is less than equal to zero. Okay, once you put it in this form, UT is in capital UT. Once you put it in this form, now you can apply the Lagrange relaxation. So this will be dependent on XT only. So it won't be dependent on UT because at the optimal solution, you have already picked U star of T. So the Lagrange multiplier will only be dependent on XT. It won't be dependent on UT. Okay, and then this problem becomes equivalent to assuming that the Lagrange multipliers here are also the geometric multipliers. It becomes equivalent to This is mu star. This is the optimal. No, it should be the geometric multiplier. Okay, so assuming that a geometric multiplier exists, if you plug in the optimal geometric multiplier here, you can actually rewrite the optimization problem at every point of time as minimum over the entire action set of the cost function plus future value plus the geometric multiplier transpose the constraints GT. 
Okay, so now that you know that you can add this geometric multiplier and convert it into the regular DP problem where the constraints actually appear in the objective function itself as a multiplier of the constraint function GT. So this leads to a much simpler algorithm. So, so much simpler, I shouldn't say algorithm, but it's actually an approximation to the original problem. So this leads to the following approximation, which is called soft constraint. Soft constraint DP, where you just pick mu T to be some positive number, positive vectors. And you basically write the running cost or the, you write the DP to minimize J summation CT plus mu T transpose GT. So this is an approximation. Let me just write it in red. So you know that this is an approximation, not an actual way to solve the constraint DP. C capital D. Okay, now this mu t could be dependent on the state. It could be independent of the state. You just want to get an approximation of the original problem. And this would be the new problem. You can only do soft constraint DP where the constraints are not very, are not binding. So it's good to have those constraints, but it's not binding. So let me give you some example. So if you have a battery that is powering a device, then battery has a natural constraint on how much energy it can output every second. And you have to respect that constraint because battery just cannot output more than that. Like it's just infeasible. It's physically impossible to uh, extract more energy than what the battery is designed for. And therefore, uh, that is a hard constraint on the system and there is no way you can do this soft constraint DP version of that. Um, on the other hand, if you're looking at the emissions coming out of the exhaust pipe in the vehicle, it is desirable to have the emissions lower than certain limit. But if the emissions are higher than certain limit at some point of time, it's, it's not really going to change the world but it's good to have lower emissions, right? So then you can transform that pro problem into a soft constraint DP problem. Uh, just introduce these Lagrange multipliers mu t, uh, which have to be positive because it's a, a inequality constraint problem. And then you add that to the running cost and that gives you the new performance index. Let me write it as J hat. Gives you a new performance index J hat that you would like to minimize over the time. And then you can apply the usual DP to solve this problem. You don't have to do the constrained version of DP to solve this problem. Okay, so that's the difference between, this is the, this is, well, let me go up. This is the exact DP. Okay, this is exactly how you should solve the constrained DP. But if you want to do some approximation, this is the way to do the approximation for constraint DP, which is soft constraint DP, where you introduce the constraint in the objective function itself using some sort of positive Lagrange multipliers. And of course, through experience, you will figure out how should you design these muties so that you get a desirable output of the DP recursion. Okay, so the emissions are under control over long periods of time. Okay, are there any questions? So if there are physical constraints, you have to apply the constraint DP recursion. If there are good to have constraints like lower emissions, you would like, you probably would be better off using soft constraint DP rather than going through the cumbersome computation of the actual constraint DP. Does that make sense? Cool.
ओके नो क्वेश्चन so going back to the earlier discussion so this kind of dp is extremely common in most of the physical systems you almost always have i mean you certainly have the objective function that you want to minimize uh but there are always constraints on the system on the set of actions you can take at every point of at every point in the state space and you have to satisfy those constraints or sometimes it's good to have those constraints but in most cases you have to satisfy those physical constraints and uh, and you have to go through the constraint dp optimization in order to solve that problem okay now what's the problem with uh, solving dynamic programming so one of the things we have realized um, and we have discussed in the previous classes but i haven't actually given you a theoretical uh, complexity result so that's what i want to do now uh so we have kind of realized that dp is extremely complicated because for every possible state xt and at every point of time t i need to solve this complicated minimization problem and so let's try and understand what would the complexity of solving such a problem like solving such a uh, not solving but applying this dp recursion is going to be okay and this is typically referred to as curse of dimensionality so let's say your xt is rn or rn is too large so 0 1 raised to n your ut is 0 1 raised to m okay so very simple state space and a simple action space and you want to implement some dp algorithm on a computer so what's the dp algorithm you just want to solve this problem ct plus vt plus 1 composition ft how would you go ahead and solve it so i have given you the state space and the action space and i ask you to implement this algorithm on a computer what would be your first step be like how would you solve how would you go about solving this problem okay so i i think the first instinct that you're going to have is look i i know that the state space is 0 1 raised to n but i don't quite think that i can store a real number on a computer okay so i i so i have like the state x so state xt is basically xt1 to xtn and each of this is a real number like a velocity of a vehicle it's a real number and i can't really store a real number on a computer so what i'm going to do is i'm going to discretize the state space so it goes through a discretization process and what you get is a discrete state space uh in say x tilde t which is equal to 0 to d let's say raised to n okay so you discretize the state space 0 to 1 into uh d intervals and then you assign a particular state number to each of those d intervals okay so if you have a velocity and velocity is between 0 to 70 miles per hour instead of considering a real number between 0 to 70 you will actually convert this into 0 1 to all the way to 70 so when i ask you at what speed are you driving you're not going to tell me that oh i'm going to i'm driving at 69.475610 not 10 6 8 miles per hour you're just going to say oh i'm driving at 69 miles an hour or i'm driving at 70 miles an hour 
right? So you just quantize the entire state space. So this is your D. Or let's act, let me actually write it D minus one. So that makes it easy. So this is my D minus one. So this is known as discretization of the state space. So this is the discretization of the state space. You will do the same thing. You will discretize the action space. And at every point of time, you will transform the function ft So you will try to do some round off errors. So you will try to do some rounding off in order to get the next state also as part of like, which is within the discretized set. Um, so that's also something you need to do, which is transform the state transition function slightly so that you are always within the discretized uh, state space and not going into the original state space. So after you go through this discretization process, you kind of realize that now your state x t or x tilde t is now zero to d minus one raised to n. U tilde t is zero to d minus one raised to m. And you come up with this sort of state and action description. Now let's look at what is the complexity of computing the value function at time capital T. Or sorry, capital T, it's equal to C capital T, but I want to know at T minus one. Okay, is the step clear so far? So we started with some um, compact state space and a compact action space, and I wanted to implement DP on a computer. So the first thing, the very first thing I have to do is actually I can't really input real numbers in the computer. So I have to discretize the state space. I have to discretize the action space. And I have to um, write the corresponding state transition function that gives you an output, which is a discretized state, not the original state. Okay, so after I have done this uh, discretization business, now I can implement the DP. I can actually write a code to solve the DP. So I have to solve this problem, which is minimum CT minus one plus VT composition F tilde T minus one of X tilde T minus one u tilde t minus one. So u tilde t minus one is in the discretized set, capital U tilde t minus one. Okay, so you've, you've fixed the state x t minus one, sorry, this should be x tilde t minus one. So you have fixed the state x tilde t minus one, and you have to minimize a function over all possible u tilde t minus one. So how would you do this minimization step? So you have discretized the action space. And I'm asking you to minimize a function over this discretized action space. So what are you going to do? You have to sweep through all combinations of X, T, U, T that you've discretized. Correct, correct. So right now I've just fixed my X, T. So, so, you, so you're right that you have to go through all possible U tilde T minus one. You have to evaluate this function and then what do you, what do, you do to compute the minimum? 
So let's say you applied this function, okay, uh, for all possible u tilde t minus one in the discretized space, and you get like a bunch of numbers, five, 10, one, two, seven, nine, 11, and so on. How would you find the minimum value in this vector? How do you find the minimum of a vector, like minimum element in a vector? How do you do that? There's a special name for it. First of all, the length of this vector is d raised to m, right? Because your u tilde t, the cardinality of this set is d raised to m. Come on, someone should be able to answer this question. How do you find the minimum of minimum element in a vector? I'm sure you guys have implemented minimum in, in MATLAB or something, right? So how do you do the, how do you compute the minimum of a vector, minimum element in a vector? Wow, I'm surprised. Okay, so you use what is known as sorting. Has anyone heard of this term sorting before? Sorting a list or sorting a vector? No one? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yes. Okay, good. So you essentially have to sort this vector in order to compute the minimum. And the minimum will of course be the first element in this sorted list, assuming you're doing the ascending, you're sorting in the ascending order. So you have to do the sorting and sorting of course requires order of D days to M number of operations. Okay, so, so you have to run uh, something which is of the order of D days to M operations for every possible state. So you pick a state, you, you create this list and then you need to sort this list in order to compute the minimum value and then you need to store it, of course, in Vt minus one, and then you have to do it for every possible state. So the sorting, the complexity of sorting is O D raised to M. The comp and then you have to do this for every possible state. Sort the list for every state x tilde t minus one in capital x tilde t minus one. And so the complexity of the computation of value function at time t minus one becomes d raised to n times o d raised to m, which is basically some order of d raised to n plus m. This is the complexity of computing Vt minus one. Okay, is there a problem with such a complexity? What, what is the problem with such a complexity of computation of Vt minus one? Can someone elucidate what the problem is? So I have D-discretization. Uh, no. Yeah. 
and you have n is the dimension of the state space, m is the dimension of the action space. So how would the complexity grow? As you do finer and finer discretization or as you increase the dimension of the state or action space? It will increase substantially. Yeah. So, so if you increase the, the discretization, then suddenly your uh, this D increases significantly. Or alternatively, if your state space is very large or if your action space is very large, which we will go over some examples today, then suddenly you, the, the overall complexity of just computing, just doing one step of the dynamic program is exceedingly large. Okay, and that's called the curse of dimensionality. So if you increase N or if you increase M, or if you increase the number of discretization bits, for the state or the action space, then the complexity of dynamic program grows exponentially large. Okay, so the complexity is exponential in dimension of xt and dimension of ut. Okay, so typically, if you have one or two dimensional examples, you can kind of implement it on a computer. But if you have a three-dimensional or four-dimensional problem and you want good accuracy in your dynamic program, then it's just going to take uh, several hours for you to run a simple dynamic program for a three-dimensional or a four-dimensional system. That's just the nature of it, nature of this algorithm itself. And this whole phenomena is typically referred to as curse of dimensionality. So as you increase the dimension of the state space or the action space, the complexity becomes exponentially, the complexity of the computation grows exponentially in the dimension. Okay, so overall the, uh, the complexity of DP the number of time steps times O raised to D N plus M. D is the number of discretization bits along every dimension. And then N is the dimension of the state. M is the dimension of the action space. And T is the time horizon. So it grows linearly with T. So if you increase, if you don't increase the dimension of the state or the action space, but if you just increase the horizon, the complexity of DP is not that much. Okay, because it's linear in T, but the real problem comes because of the dimensionality of the state and action spaces. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, so if you have an embedded system, embedded device, and you want to implement DP, you have to make sure that the state and the action spaces of the order of one dimension. It could be one dimensional or it could be two dimensional, but it can't be really high dimensional state or action space. I mean, it's just impossible to run a DP on an embedded device due to the curse of dimensionality. Now let's look at some examples of DP that are usually implemented in the modern systems. So these are the, the uh, applications of dynamic programming that are sort of emerging. So these applications have been looked at in the past 10 years, 10 or so years. And that's why they are sort of important applications of dynamic programming. So the first application that I want to talk about is data center cooling problem. using renewable energy. Okay, and it's kind of important that they you, you do it using renewable energy is because, uh, because a lot of companies, particularly big companies like Google and Facebook and Amazon, they are committed to increasing or decreasing their carbon footprint, particularly at, the, at their data centers, which basically means that they install solar panels on the top of their data centers and they just want to use solar energy 
to cool their uh, data centers or or they could use wind energy to cool their data centers so the goal is to cool the data center using renewable energy and how would you achieve that so the problem is as follows the data center typically is a very large building and there are essentially three inputs uh, or three states that the data centers have the first state is the temperature of the data center uh, on, and typically data centers would be divided into zones and you would be looking at the temperature of each zone within the data center. So it's not like the temperature is uniform across the entire data center. So there is temperature in different zones. Then there is the traffic, which is the data traffic. So how much data are you, uh, or how much processing is happening within the data center because that affects the amount of heat energy expelled by the computing machinery into the surrounding. So this is the data traffic. And then there is, of course, renewable generation that uh, that the data center needs to feed. And I mean, that comes from, the, from some renewable energy source uh, in and around data center. And the output is, of course, the thermal extraction, which could be due to the air conditioning system. And the goal of this uh, uh, data center cooling problem is to take these three things into account. These are the states. So take the state into account, identify how much thermal extraction needs to be done in order to maintain the temperature within set boundaries within the data center. So you want the temperature to be within like some region, let's say 20 degrees Celsius to 50 degrees Celsius. You just want the temperature to be between these limits and you want to identify an algorithm or a, or a dynamic program. You, come, you want to solve the dynamic programming algorithm in order to solve this problem. Typically renewable energy has uh, some uh, daily variation. So solar energy will be pretty high during the day, but it won't be available at night or wind energy would be non-existent during the day or very low during the day, but very high during the night. Okay, so there is some sort of uh, you know, they have some diurnal patterns, uh, renewable generation. So you have to, the dynamic programming has to take that into account. Similarly, the data center traffic also has diurnal pattern. So for instance, if the data center is housing Netflix videos or movies, then it has to be pretty active from 7 p.m. to 10 p.m. because that's when most of the people go home and they start watching Netflix or YouTube videos or whatever, right? Um, and, and so the traffic itself has a very diurnal pattern which depends on how humans behave uh, in aggregate. So, so, so the traffic as well as the renewable generation has some sort of pattern over the period of a day, over the period of a week. And therefore the DP has to account for these patterns and has to come up with a thermal extraction scheme to control the temperature of the data center. Okay, so that's one example where DP has typically been successfully applied. Or at least that's what we have heard in the news. Uh, we are not aware because uh, whether this has actually been, like what are the benefits and complexity and all that stuff, we just don't know about it because in the news it has just come up that DeepMind applied reinforcement learning to solve the data center cooling problem. That's all we know about. Maybe some publication has already come out in the last few months uh, addressing or talking about this uh, real world problem. Okay, any, any question on this data center cooling problem? I hope so. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I have a question on the curse of dimensionality. Oh, of course. Um, so you were saying that uh, it's difficult to put it on embedded systems, but the DP itself, you only have to calculate it once, right? Because when you're actually implementing it, yeah. you should have an, uh, like a, a function for the action. Right. So right. could you just calculate the DP 
right like, run the dp algorithm on say like a big gpu right when you actually go to implement it just put the the action uh plan on an embedded system right right actually that's a very beautiful question so you know in in real world systems typically the state space and the action space and the constraints and all of that depends on some real world circumstances which are not necessarily determined a priori uh, so wow it's a very deep question okay um how do i answer that because that was kind of the advantage of it over uh, an open loop policy, right? Was that you didn't right. recalculate it. That's right, that's right. So so it really depends on what the description of the state space is, okay? So, uh, you know, I want to come up with a real world problem to try and explain what I mean. Okay, so, so here is the problem, okay? So the real world, uh, let's say you are driving your vehicle, right? And arguably you can, use GPUs and supercomputers and whatnot to compute the optimal set of actions for every possible situations one may encounter in real world. You can do that and you can implement that algorithm on the vehicle and, and that's it, you are done, right? And that's mm -hmm. what you're arguing and that is absolutely possible. However, the problem is when you deploy these systems in the real world, there are some states or some information that you don't have beforehand but it appears while you are driving the vehicle. So, uh, so I'll give you some real practical examples. I was driving in Yellowstone and there were bison on the road, right? And I just had to stop my car until the entire like, uh, I don't know, it's, it's called flock or whatever. The flock of bison crossed the road. Only then we could drive our car safely across the highway. So, now, the question is, in the real world situation, I saw bison on the road, but when you were running the GPU, when you were running the driving algorithm or you were computing the DP algorithm on the GPU or on the supercomputer, did you account for the fact that there may be large animals on the road or not, right? Mm -hmm. And that's really the key challenge. So you have to be able to account for every possible situation that may arise in the real world setting in order for you to compute GPU, sorry, compute the DP, um, uh, compute the optimal policy on the GPU and then implement it on actual system. And typically you can do it for a very simple system, let's say a chemical plant, which whose problem is just to, you know, mix two chemicals together. If that is the only problem that chemical plant is solving, yes, you can absolutely run a GPU or whatever, you can compute the DP, thing offline and you can implement it on the system and it'll just work beautifully. And that's how things have been done since the advent of dynamic programming. However, if you're looking at a system where there is extremely large set of uncertainty that you just cannot uh, predict beforehand, the problem is you cannot really apply DP in those situations because you require crucial data, crucial information uh, uh, while you are running the vehicle or while you are uh, running that system in order to recompute the DP, recompute the optimal solution, and then use that optimal solution to uh, drive the system, right? So this bison example is just one example. I've had situations where there, are, there was a big trash bag on the highway when I was driving at 65 miles an hour. I've had that situation and there is just no way on earth somebody who's designing an autonomous car would think, oh, you know, there could be a situation where there is a huge pile of trash on the highway. And therefore I need to account for that while I'm designing my dynamic programming algorithm. Does that make sense? Yeah, but then doesn't that, cause I guess the case of the bison, then that's almost like an entire, entirely new state. Exactly. So then the, DP equation kind of just changes entirely, right? That's right. That's right. And even if you had it deployed on an embedded system, like the the algorithm itself has to change. Right. Right. Exactly. Well, the so so here is what you can do. You can create a specific state called road obstruction, mm 
And while you are driving the system, you can try and analyze whether the thing that I'm seeing in the front is actually an obstruction or not. And it could be a child playing on the road. It could be a bison, you know, just crossing the road. It could be a pile of trash on the road, right? So it really depends on how you have determined the state space, how you have created the inference algorithm that takes the sensor input and figures out where exactly in the state space does what I'm seeing fits. And then what is the corresponding optimal strategy that I need to apply on the system? So, so those are sort of complexity that you encounter when you are actually applying DP on a production system. And that's why it's typically better to put DP on the embedded system themselves because some of these things could be updated in the future. Uh, through a software upgrade. So you could update some of these things in the future, but you know, in simple settings, like mixing two chemicals or like, you know, just running your air conditioning system at house, it's not really going to see any sophisticated situation. And so arguably you don't have to embed it in the system. You can just compute the optimal policy once and execute that optimal policy on the system. That's it. You don't have to recompute DP every, every time. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, sure. That's a great question. Any other question on the curse of dimensionality or, or the example data center cooling problem? No? Okay, so while we are talking about it, let me just give you the autonomous driving problem. And in the autonomous driving situation, at least the way the current uh, way people are trying to attack this problem, you essentially have three sensors. One is the radar, one is the LIDAR, and the third one is the camera. And the car looks at all these sensor inputs, and then it has to output essentially two things, steering, and acceleration or brake commands, okay? Um, again, this is uh, what you have to do is you have to look at the radar data, LIDAR data, camera data. You have to infer what the current state of the vehicle is. And based on that state, you have to apply the DP in order to come up with what the steering angle and what the acceleration slash brake command should be on the system, okay? now. In this case, maybe the temperature is two dimensional, renewable energy is one dimensional, the traffic could be one or two dimensional object. So the overall state space is pretty low. On the other hand, if you look at the output from the radar or output from the LIDAR or output from the camera, the actual output is actually extremely high dimensional. Okay. And now the question is you have to process this extremely high dimensional data in order to figure out exactly where in the state space your car currently lies in. And then you have to apply the DP algorithm to come up with optimal steering or acceleration slash brake command. Okay, so there is some issue of feature extraction in this problem. And one of the greatest issues with enabling autonomous driving is exactly this problem. How do you go from this high dimensional object or observation to the exact location in the state space for this vehicle, for this car, autonomous car? And I personally think that this problem is not solvable, at least not with LIDAR and camera. You really need to come up with some other sensors to be able to solve this problem because one of the issues with camera output and LIDAR output is that you, you kind of know where you lie in the state space, but there is some possibility of error and you cannot control that possibility of error. And that's the key issue. And let me give you an example. So I was in a Oak Ridge National, I was visiting Oak Ridge National Lab a few months ago and one of the scientists there was telling me that 
they were running this autonomous car on the road i mean of course it was being driven by a human being but what's happening with the camera is the camera is detecting a cyclist some points of time and then it says the cyclist suddenly disappeared for another 2 seconds and then it suddenly reappeared after 3 seconds and now the question for the autonomous car is i mean the camera basically misclassified so at, there was actually a bicyclist on the road but for those 2 seconds when the camera couldn't detect that bicyclist it, it was misclassified as there is no object on the road but there was indeed a bicyclist on the road and now the question is how would you trust a sensor which is not perfect in a safety critical setting and there is no way you can prove that if you use this deep neural network which has been trained on this 1 billion date 1 billion images is going to correctly classify a bicyclist on the road for like 100% of the time or it would correctly classify trash on the road 100% of the time or it would classify bison on the road 100% of the time right it's just impossible for you to certify that for the camera output and therefore i personally think that uh, something more sophisticated is needed which could classify all these objects extremely accurately even in the presence of ice even in the presence of snow even in like bad weather and only then you could improve upon the um, current baseline which is how humans drive their vehicles okay so our eyes are perfect we can actually classify everything 100 with 100% accuracy there is never a misclassification with human eye assuming the eye is perfect but there is always misclassification with a camera or lidar data and that's the problem that people are trying to solve and i think it is inherently unsolvable problem so that's all i have for today uh, in the next class we are going to talk about some of the approximation methods for solving dynamic programming equation to address some of these problems that dynamic programming problems that we are talking about okay i'll be happy to take any questions um, and if there are no questions feel free to drop off the call Professor, I have a question. Yeah, sure. So, for the problem you're talking about with autonomy, um, that would apply specifically to the higher levels of autonomy. But if you're looking at potentially like level three, yes, ideally with sensor fusion, the problem is solvable, right? Because That's the right. human still has, uh, there's still human in the loop. Right. Right. That's right. I'm talking about level five autonomy. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I. I. Yeah. That's still a big problem. Yeah, yeah. So, in your opinion, again, this is a very just out there question. What, right. uh, what additional, you know, sensing do you think would be required, or you know, uh, any research that's happening that would complement? Um, you, you know, I, right, right. I mean, I, you know, it's a good question. So, so I just want to consider the edge cases, and then I want to figure out what kind of sensing would be required to solve that edge case scenario. so what are the situations where i've gotten into an accident or where i was nearly in an accident so mm -hmm. one of the situation was when there were, when the road was extremely icy so there was just no way i could see the dividers that divides the you know one lane with the other lane so that's one situation the second situation is where when i saw trash on the road that's a completely unexpected state I mean I I still always so whenever people talk about autonomous driving that is the image I have in mind how would the autonomous car recognize that there is trash like a whole bag of trash on the highway and you need to go into the other lane in order to safely drive your car on that highway and I'm not very sure whether the current autonomous vehicles that are driving on the road uh, all all over the world whether they are being trained on on trash like you know just okay. piles of trash I, i don't think they are being trained to classify a pile of trash on the road mm -hmm. and 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 i just don't have an answer to that question like how would you i mean i i just don't know how how would you 
classify trash on the road using existing or a child playing maybe child playing is something that's easy like it's it's an everyday situation uh, but a pile of trash on the road is not everyday situation so or or bison on the road that's also not everyday situation deer on the road on the other hand is sort of everyday situation but bison on the road happens only in like specific situations like in alaska or in yellowstone or or some of these national parks so basically fringe cases yeah 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 so i guess infrared sensor can identify like uh, you know warm blooded animals uh, mm -hmm. for cold blooded animals on the road like snakes i'm not very sure what kind of sensors would be needed um and, and then for trash i just I, i have absolutely no idea what sensor would be able to recognize trash on the road like i i just don't can't think of anything mm -hmm. so yeah I, i'm just at a loss for that if if i had solved the problem i would i would not be teaching this class <laughs> 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 yeah uh yeah. yeah all right thank you yeah thanks thanks for this question okay all right i'll see you guys on wednesday then